Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Nell Pepper, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so pleased to introduce this virtual event with Ron Abramitsky and Leah Bustan presenting their co-authored book, Streets of Gold, America's Untold Story of Immigrant Success. I hope you're all well and safe. Thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight. Harvard Bookstore's virtual event series continues this spring alongside our in-person programming, bringing authors and their work to our community, both digitally and in Cambridge. Please check out the full event schedule on our website at harvard.com slash events. And while you're on the site, you can sign up for our email newsletter for more updates and browse our bookshelves from home or indeed wherever you may be. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button on your screen and we will get through as many questions as time allows. This event will also have closed captioning available. So depending on the version of Zoom that you are using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. In the chat, I will be posting a link to purchase copies of Streets of Gold on harvard.com. Your purchases make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. We thank you so much for your continued support amidst these uh, really wild couple of years. And beyond that, thank you so much for continuing to tune in, not only in support of this event series, but also of the really fantastic staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstores. We sincerely appreciate your support. Lastly, as you may have experienced, probably have experienced in virtual gatherings such as these, technical issues may arise. If they do, we will do our best to resolve them quickly. And we thank you so much for your patience and understanding. And now I am delighted to introduce our speakers. Ron Abramitsky is Professor of Economics and the Senior Associate Dean for the Social Sciences at Stanford University, a Research Associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, a Senior Fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, and a former co-editor of Explorations in Economic History. His previous book, The Mystery of the Kibbutz, examines how communities based on income equality survived in Israel Israel for over a century and the conditions under which more equal societies can thrive. Leah Bustan is Professor of Economics and Director of the Industrial Relations Section at Princeton University. She serves as Co-Director of the Development of the American Economy Program at the National Bureau of Economic Research and is Co-Editor of the American Economic Journal Applied Economics. Her previous book, Competition in the Promised Land examines the effect of the great Black migration from the rural South during and after World War II. She has written for the New York Times, The American Prospect, and Slate. Tonight, they will be discussing their new book, Streets of Gold, America's Untold Story of Immigrant Success. Using the tools of modern data analysis and 10 years of pioneering research, Ron and Leah debunk both the fear-mongering and the sentimentality offered by popular myths of American immigration, re replacing them with a surprising view of the American past and present. I am very pleased to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, Ron and Leah. Well, thank you very much, and, and thank you all for coming. Uh, Leah and I are very happy to be here and to tell you a little bit about our book, Streets of Gold. We decided to write this book because we wanted to bring data and long-term perspective on the immigration debate, which is often based on fear and anecdotes rather than on evidence. And so the book compares the experience of the 30 million immigrants who came 100 years ago, what we like to call the Ellis Island generation to immigrants today. And we often hear this nostalgic view that European immigrants assimilated very quickly in the past, and that's in contrast to new immigrant groups today that do not attempt to assimilate uh, into the US. And this is where the phrase streets of gold came from. It was this shorthand of the idea that you could arrive to the US without a dollar in your pocket, uh, but quickly find opportunities. But of course, we chose streets of gold as a title for a different reason, 
an unknown Italian immigrant in the 1900s said something like, I came to America because I heard the streets there were paved with gold. But when I got here, I found out three things. First, the streets were not paved with gold. Second, they were not paved at all. And third, I was the one expected to pave them. <laughs> so, so in this research, Leah and I are doing together over the last 15 years, we build new big data sets to reassess some of our common myths about immigration and the American dream over the last two centuries. But uh, don't let the words big data dissuade you from reading the book. This is not a boring data and statistics book. Rather, we tell the stories of many immigrant families that bring the data to life. We tell the stories of quite a few immigrants who passed through Ellis Island from various European countries. We tell the stories of the life journeys of Asian and Mexican immigrants who came to the country more recently. We tell the stories of Leah's grandparents and of my relatives, uh, which are, by the way, both observations in our big data. Our families came from Eastern Europe, started as manual workers, and their children eventually moved into the profession, a common pattern that we tend to find in, in the larger data. In fact, our big data if you think about it, it's nothing more than the systematic collection of millions of immigrant stories. You can think of us like the curious grandchildren who search their grandparents in the historical census records and now multiply this effort by millions. Uh, in the census, we can see uh, the immigrants and where they live and who they marry and how they name their children, what they do for a living and so on. We can then link them up to the following census and then the following census and then we can link up their children and that way we can create genealogies of many many uh, immigrants that we can follow over time and we can then analyze the big data that we put together and see how much of what we know about immigration in the US is based in myth rather than in fact so we ask questions like is it really true that immigrants started poor and move up the ladder within their own lifetime what about their children how did immigrants integrate more broadly into society, who they married, how they named their children, and how uh, they, their experience compares to the experience of immigrants today. And so with our new data, we can reassess some of the common myths. Uh, today, we will discuss just a few of them. Is it really true that today's immigrants are any less upwardly mobile than past immigrants? Is it really true? that today's immigrants integrate more slowly into society than past immigrants? Is it really true that immigrants steal the jobs from the US born and reduce their wages and, and so on? And so in the next 20, 25 minutes, Leah and I will try to go through some of these questions and separate myths from the facts. And then we'll open it up for, for questions. And then uh, Leah will start with the rags to riches myth. Yes, we were first inspired to work on this book because um, we, I think, bought into this nostalgic view of the Ellis Island generation, the idea that immigrants who came to the country 100 years ago from Europe were able to move up the ladder economically very quickly, you know, that they arrive with a dollar in their pocket, but then they can quickly move into the middle class and maybe into the professions. And there were some contrasts between the earlier generation 100 years ago and immigrants today that we were hearing in the public debate. So we wanted to assess um, whether this is really true. And we found out actually that the rags to riches myth of the Ellis Island generation was wrong in two different ways. First, it's not the case that all of the immigrants who came from Europe 100 years ago arrived in rags. Many of them actually arrived already earning more than US born workers. So half of the immigrants from that time came from countries like Germany or England or Scotland. And these were areas that were ahead of the US economically and in, in terms of their educational opportunities or they were neck and neck. And so immigrants from these countries were able to do very well from the beginning. So to the extent that they were moving to riches, um, they already started out doing quite well. They were not moving from rags. And then the other half of immigrants, and this is primarily immigrants coming from Southern and Eastern Europe, did arrive poor. Um, and these immigrants did experience some upward mobility in their own lifetime. 
um, but the pace of their upward mobility was pretty slow and actually very similar to the pace of upward mobility of immigrants today. Immigrants today are coming from all around the world. They're coming from Latin America, from Asia, and some of them are starting out um, coming from very poor countries. And so they do have a lot of ground to cover, but their pace of upward mobility is quite similar to the Ellis Island generation. So we did do a little bit of thinking about why does this myth persist? It's so strong in our culture. There's very little that we all agree on these days. You know, there's a lot of polarization, but there's one myth that seems to be quite widely shared, and that is that the Ellis Island generation was good. We hear politicians like Barack Obama lauding Italian immigrants for how much they contributed to society. But we also hear right-wing pundits like Rush Limbaugh doing exactly the same thing and almost in the same language. So this is a very, very persistent myth. And we think that part of it has to do with just the way in which we forget over time. A lot of the struggles that happened in the first generation of the Ellis Island immigrants happened over a hundred years ago. And so that is history that happened four generations ago or five generations ago. When I think about my own family, I'm able to remember my grandparents, my grandfather who was a doctor and he himself was the child of immigrants but I'm not able to remember the immigrant generation. That would be my great grandfather. Um, I, yeah, I never had a chance to meet him. Um, he arrived in the US in 1891 and he spent his entire life selling odds and ends. And he never moved up occupationally. Um, he needed to send his kids out to work actually before his older kids were able to finish school. And they were selling newspapers on the street corner to bring home an extra few pennies to help the family. Um, and so I think because in many of our own families, that struggle was so long ago, we tend to forget um, how hard the first generation of the Ellis Island period really had. And I also think this is what we're taught in high school. Um, this is part of our national curriculum. So even for those of you who may not have direct family members, it sort of percolates into um, our national consciousness. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to Ron to talk about the children of immigrants, sort of like my own grandfather. Um, his, he was one of eight, and his older siblings, um, who did have to leave school on the early side, uh, did move up from where uh, their father um, had been. Uh, they were working as stenographers or bookkeepers. Um, and then my grandfather, who was younger, and so he was able to benefit from his older siblings helping out, um, he became a doctor. So how representative is that, the upper mobility that we see in my family? And Ron will be able to, to speak to that part of the myth. And we find that that's a very representative story for what we find. Uh, we find that both today and in the past, the children of immigrants are, are very economically mobile, uh, even more so than the children of US born parents who grow up in similar households. So this is true for families today from, from nearly every sending country that we can look at, including uh, from poorer countries like El Salvador, Mexico and, and Laos. The, the children uh, beyond that, uh, the children of immigrants from say Mexico and the Dominican Republic today are just as likely to move up from their parents' circumstances as were the children of poor Swedes and Danes a uh, hundred years ago. And, and so while the immigrant themselves often lag behind, like Leah described, their children caught up with the children of US born. And, and again, from nearly every sending country. And, and when we do even this kind of, if you want to think about it as a more apple to apple comparison, looking at children growing up at equally poor uh, families, uh, we find that the children of poor immigrants do better than the children of, of the US born who grew up equally poor. And this pattern again holds for immigrants from every sending country. Now we ask ourselves the question, you know, why, why is it the case that the children of immigrants outperform the children of the US born. And, and, and in the past, uh, despite uh, the, the family lore, we find that uh, this was not uh, because immigrants necessarily invested more in the education of their children. So, so if anything, the children of immigrants in the past were less likely to stay in school than the children of US born parents at the same point of the income distribution. But instead, what we find is that much of it is about location choice. 
So immigrants tended to move to areas and cities in the United States that offer the best opportunities for upward mobility for their children. Whereas the US born were kind of more likely to be rooted in place. So in the past, this meant often that immigrants were very unlikely to move to the US South, which was a place of uh, low economic mobility. Now you can ask, of course, why don't the US born move to places of higher economic opportunity? And, and that's kind of quite natural because moving to opportunity also means leaving home. And, and, and if you were born in a certain place in the US, your parents and grandparents maybe are from there, your friends are there, your networks are there. And so you don't just think about the economic returns and where can I, me and my kids earn the most money. But when you're a, an immigrant, you already left home. And so you may as well move to a place with uh, uh, more opportunities uh, for you and for your children. So that kind of covers, if you want, the, some of the economic aspects of, of our work. But then, of course, we then often ask, well, OK, so immigrants and their children are doing well economically. But what about what about cultural assimilation and assimilation into uh, immigrants, assimilation into the US society? And that's kind of what Leah can, can tell us more about. Yes, we are economists. But in, in terms of contributing to the public debate, we know that voters and the public care not only about how immigrants are faring economically, but also whether they'll ever really fit in and become American. And I think that this, there's one very strong uh, myth is the idea that European immigrants 100 years ago were maybe culturally closer to the US born, um, or that they wanted to become American more strongly, that there was an ethic of Americanization at the time. And so therefore, you're immigrants 100 years ago assimilated more quickly in a cultural dimension. Whereas today, immigrants are coming from a diverse set of backgrounds, um, or maybe there's an ethic of multiculturalism in that there's a sense that you don't have to lose your own identity. Um, and so immigrants are slower to assimilate these days. Um, you know, I really have to say before doing our work that that was a myth that I bought into. Um, I thought, well, we have a more multicultural society, and so maybe immigrants don't have to change their identity. Um, they continue to live in the United States as Americans, but they don't really um, take efforts to become American the way that immigrants did 100 years ago. And it turns out that that uh, view of the world, that myth is very is actually quite wrong in the data. Um, and so there's a lot of aspects um, about behavior and attitudes um, and daily life that we're not able to observe in the data. And that might be quite relevant to the question, like what do immigrants have for dinner? How do they celebrate holidays? Do they celebrate July 4th or Thanksgiving? Um, what clothes do they wear? And those are things that since we've been using big data sets, we're not able to observe really at scale. Um, but there are other aspects of you know, becoming American uh, that we can set out to try to measure, and we try to measure as many of them as we can. Um, so questions like, are immigrants moving out of enclave neighborhoods? Um, are they marrying people from other countries or people who were born in the US? And one that's most interesting to us is, how do immigrants name their children as they spend more time? in the country. So we really tried to measure these as systematically as possible over time. We wanted to have the same measures for today as we have for the past. Um, and our measure of um, the names that immigrants give for their kids was actually inspired by Ron's own family. Um, so Ron is an example of one of the, of the many immigrants in our data set. Um, and um, Ron, when he first arrived in the U.S. as a student, wasn't sure if he was going to stay in the U.S. permanently um, or move back to Israel. And his first two kids had names that were pretty short, but at the same time, sort of hard for Americans to pronounce. Um, and for his third kid, after knowing, yes, I'm going to stay in the U.S., and maybe he can speak to whether embracing American culture, um, his third kid, um, his name is Tom which works in Hebrew, but also, you know, is very easy for Americans to say. So we wanted to study families like Ron's um, on a much broader basis um, with as many observations as possible and honestly, millions of observations. Um, so what we want to do is follow mothers as they spend more time in the country, immigrant mothers, and they might have one kid a year or two after arrival and then a second kid five or six years after arrival and take a look at the names that they give to their kids. So to talk about for a second, 
what is an American sounding name? I mean, that's really changed a lot over time. There's nothing inherent about a name that is American or non-American. It really depends on just the naming patterns that we see in the data. So one thing that was really interesting to me is that the name Eric and the name Kurt, for example, which are two names that these days I think of as just quintessentially American, they were actually some of the most foreign sounding names 100 years ago. If your name was Eric in 1900, chances were very high that you were born in a Scandinavian country. If your name was Kurt, you were very likely to be born in Germany. So we allow the data to tell us what's a foreign name and what's an American sounding name. Um, and allow that to change. And what we see is that as immigrants spend more time in the country, um, they start to shift towards more American sounding names over time. And what's really interesting is that they do that at the same pace in the past and present. And that's what really blew my mind. I mean, I was expecting that as you spend more time in the US, you're probably going to um, learn more about what names are popular and choose different names, but I didn't expect the real similarity between past and present. And what's also interesting is that it's the groups that politicians point to and say, oh, these are groups that will never fit in, like the Southern and Eastern Europeans of the past and the Mexicans today that actually change the names that they give for their kids the fastest, giving us a sign that these are groups that are trying uh, to fit in. And so I do want to you know, put a little asterisk beside the idea of assimilation or fitting in. Um, it's not something that we are trying to take a normative position on and say this is something immigrants should have to do. But we're just taking a look at the data to see what do immigrants themselves choose to do um, and use that to try to compare past and present. And one other point I want to make that I think is relevant for some of the immigration debates going on these days is about refugees. Um, so just over the past year, we've had two different rounds of discussion about refugees, Afghan refugees, and then Ukrainian refugees. And this has really been a perennial question in the US. Um, if there's a group that's facing persecution, should that group be allowed to move to the US? Um, and one of the questions is, are refugees assimilating? And something that's very hard to look at in the past because we didn't have an official refugee policy in, in 1900. Um, but what we were able to do is look at um, over a thousand oral histories that were taken by the Ellis Island Foundation of immigrants who had come to the US a um, uh, hundred years ago. Um, and each immigrant was um, given an interview and it, it took um, around an hour of time uh, to interview each immigrant. Um, and so from those long stories of immigrants own histories, we were able to classify immigrants as either refugees who are fleeing from persecution or war or economic migrants. And then from the fact that we had an hour of recorded speech for each immigrant, we were able to assess their ability to speak English. Do they have an accent when they spoke? Do they use complicated sentence structure? Did they use fancy vocabulary or simple words? And we were able to find that refugees assimilated faster than economic migrants um, at that time um, and that's consistent with what people are finding these days as well. If you think about it, it does kind of make sense that as a refugee, you're not expecting to ever be able to go home to your home country. So the United States is a new home to you for sure, and you really will take the steps to fit in. So I'm going to turn back to Ron for a few minutes. Um, I do want to, of course, reserve time for your questions. Um, but um, one question that might be on people's mind is, well, okay, so immigrants have been doing really well now, they're doing really well 100 years ago, um, but what does this mean for the US born? Is there a zero sum nature uh, to the economy that if immigrants are doing well, somehow that's taking away from opportunities for the US born? Yeah, and we, and we find that, uh, that this too is, is, is a myth. So, so this idea that, uh, you know, there is a fixed pie, only fixed number of jobs, and then they. they uh, so it's obvious that if immigrants come to the U.S., uh, they they will definitely steal the jobs of of U.S. born and will reduce their wages. That 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 ends up uh, not being true as well. Again, it's not to say that uh, you know when immigrants come, yeah, there there are no losers. Of course, there are winners and losers from immigration, but overall. Uh, we don't find that immigrants tend to harm the US born by taking their jobs. Uh, 
Uh, and, and again, this is a, uh, we look at various episodes in history, for example, the closing of the borders in the 1920s, you know, where immigration uh, was down from about a million per year to about 150,000 per year. Well, when there were so, this was like the largest uh, border closure in, in US history. And we talked about, we talk about it quite a bit in the book, but when borders closed, it's not that the US born wages were, were, were higher. Uh, it's, uh, and, and again, this is like uh, in part because, you know, like, uh, uh, Im the immigrants and, and U.S. bond are not perfect substitutes. So there's a menu of options that firms can, can choose from. And, uh, and it turns out that uh, when an, an immigrant doesn't sh uh, shows up, it's not necessarily at the expense of the U.S. bond. Today, for example, this is, you can think about it as immigrants tend to hold jobs that have few available U.S. bond workers. So either uh, very highly educated positions in tech and science. Those positions actually, if anything, tend to create and open jobs for, for the US born. All immigrants ten, uh, can work in, can do work that requires uh, little education, like picking crops by hand or washing dishes, landscaping, you know, taking care of the elderly, uh, jobs that uh, we don't find uh, that many US born workers that, uh, that are willing to do at the, at the, going, at the going wages. And, and so that's, uh, that idea we find is oversimplistic, the idea that immigrant success necessarily comes at the expense of, of the US born. We also uh, don't find evidence that immigrants are more likely to commit crime. So immigrants in the past, uh, and especially today, are less likely than US born to be arrested and incarcerated for, for I think, all manners of, of offenses. So that idea is, is not true. Uh, as well. So we kind of want to, you know, we kind of want to leave some time for questions. I'll, I'll give it back to Leah to, to kind of wrap it up and then we'll open it up for, uh, for, for some of your questions. Thanks. Um, so given the really optimistic story that we're telling, and in fact, if you could see a um, image of our cover, you can see the immigrants in the foreground uh, coming to New York City with a rainbow behind. So it's very optimistic. Um, image that we have on, uh, on the cover of our book. Um, given the optimistic story that we're telling, it's not surprising actually that um, it turns out that public opinion is strongly in favor of immigration these days. Um, so Gallup poll has been asking um, the public about their attitudes towards immigration for at least the past 25 years. And in this year, 2021, it's actually the year with the highest ever um, support for immigration, 75% of Americans saying that immigration is good for the country. So we think of this as a silent majority. And then, you know, you have to ask yourself, why haven't we been more successful politically at changing and reforming our immigration system? Um, there's been a lot of gridlock. So why are we so stuck? And it turns out that yes, the average respondent in Gallup, for example, um, is in favor of immigration, but there's a lot of polarization by party. Um, and we've gone back to look at the congressional record to assess how politicians are speaking about immigration. Actually, in that case, we can go all the way back to 1880, and we see that indeed speeches about immigration on average today are quite positive, but they're split by party with speeches given by Democratic representatives much more positive and speeches given by Republicans much less positive. So when we have that situation of partisan gridlock, it makes sense that we're not able to take action. Um, so you know, then it's like, well, are we just in a, a moment of despair? Um, we know that there's a lot of people who want the immigration system to change, but there's not much to do about it. And as economic historians, I think one thing that I like about being an economic historian is we can see that history has changed so much. And we know that we're not necessarily stuck in the moment that we're in. And so we take a lot of heart from a period in relatively recent US history when attitudes towards immigration and then immigration policy changed a lot. And that was the period right after World War II. So at that time, as Ron was just mentioning, the border had been closed to immigration from Europe. And that took place in the 1920s and it was still true in the 40s after the war. Um, and at the time, the president was Harry Truman, and he thought, well, we need to do something about this. But given current attitudes about immigration, it's not clear that we're going to be successful. So he went about to try to change hearts and minds about immigration, to change the narrative from an idea of immigrants being apart from us, stranger 
people who are invading the country, to thinking immigrants are part of us. Immigrants are Americans. They are patriotic. They served in World War II alongside of us. They built the country. They built our cities. And so that narrative that I think contributes to the nostalgic view of the Ellis Island immigrants and is something that I have in mind when I think about U.S. history, that came about through a political process of trying to retell the story. Um, so we do hope that by retelling the story of uh, what immigrants have done for the U.S. economy 100 years ago and what they're continuing to do for the U.S. economy now um, will make a difference. And, you know, we are basically calling for bravery um, on the part of politicians not to be in a defensive position to always be reactive uh, to accusations of, oh, you're being soft on the border and so on, but instead to be really out front um, leading and telling the positive story, the optimistic story about um, immigration and the streets of gold. So um, we're uh, very keen to hear your thoughts and I see there's a few questions in the Q&A. Um, and so Nell is gonna moderate for us. And if you haven't uh, raised a question yet, but you'd like to participate in the conversation, please do. Thank you so much. Uh, this was fascinating. So yes, to, to start us off, um, we have a questioner who asks, in the face of anti-immigration sentiment, it's common to hear that a steady supply of immigrants to America is important because immigrants are hired for jobs that US born people refuse to do. Does that bear out in the data? And either way, is this a useful or helpful argument? It seems to me to justify exploiting immigrants and all low income workers. Um, so we have been really surprised to see that throughout a hundred years of history, economists have been looking for evidence that immigrants harm US born workers and have not been able to find it. And the labor market and labor market institutions have changed a lot. So in the time period that we looked at, we looked in the 1920s when the border closed, and that was a period before modern labor law, before the union movement took off and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, modern economists have looked at more recent data and they've looked at episodes from the 1960s or the 1980s or the 2000s, and they've found very similar patterns as well. And so I think that we all have in mind this sort of simplistic view that comes from Econ 101. And we're economists, so we will cop to being partially responsible <laughs> for that view. Or you got to start um, somewhere, right? <laughs> which, you know, which is an idea of, you know, immigrants are workers, everything else remains the same, and a new worker comes in, but nothing else has changed. And so if that worker is employed, it must be that someone else has lost their job. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a very zero sum way of, of looking at things. Yeah. But one thing to keep in mind is that when immigrants come in, they're also consumers. So they need a place to live. Someone has to build a house for them. That's going to be a set of construction jobs. Um, they need a place for their kids to go to school. And so a teacher needs to, you know, someone has to become a teacher. Um, and so there's all sorts of new demand that comes in place. And I think that that's um, like one of the um, pieces of the story that's often missing. Um, just adding that one that next layer to the story um, can help explain why it is that um, that it's not a, a zero sum story and that immigrants don't necessarily have to um, harm the US born. Is, is, there, is, is there sort of a, how do I put this? Does it, or I, I mean, is this even kind of possible to see? I mean, that, that they tend to, I guess your, your first question kind of addressed this a bit too, which is how, um, that there's this myth that, that all, that anyone who, who emigrates to the U.S. sort of comes here poor and then kind of goes up the ladder. So I suppose just in the data that that just doesn't, that doesn't bear out necessarily, but like that folks didn't always come in and sort of immediately go into like the worst low wage job imaginable, right? Right. So, uh, so, so, I, I, so I guess the, the, there, is, there is less debate about what the effect of high skill workers, I guess, on, on the U.S. born, you know, it's uh, people can understand the, you know, that uh, the science and the, the tech works, uh, they contribute to the economy. But I guess one of the things that come out, the messages that come out of our book is that even we shouldn't worry too much about our lower immigration, lower educated immigration, because even if they 
don't necessarily catch up and, uh, and quickly move up the occupational ladder within their own lifetime, their children do, and their children mm-hmm. do, do quite well. And this is like, uh, there was this uh, uh, proceeding of science uh, report uh, uh, some years ago uh, that basically said that, uh, well, maybe immigrants are more likely to uh, use the welfare system and to uh, to be uh, relatively in debt, you know, if, if when mm-hmm. they come, there are schools that have to be built and so on, but their children more than pay for the debts of their parents, basically. Mm-hmm. And so that is kind of like the message that comes from our work, that even children of poor immigrants rise and, and end up contributing quite a lot to the, to the economy. Mm-hmm. So we shouldn't mm-hmm. focus too much on uh, just the high education, uh, high, uh, highly educated workers. I want to get at one other thing that was in the question. The question was actually quite profound and there was a lot of different components to it. One is that, you know, are we um, inherently exploiting low wage labor that's willing to come to the US? Um, And that if workers did not come as immigrants, maybe the pay for those jobs would rise. Mm -hmm. And maybe those would become jobs with a a living wage that, that we would feel comfortable taking as Americans. Um, and I think that there is, um, there's a lot of attraction to that idea, um, and I hear that idea quite a lot, uh, but there are some cases that we can study that it, where this sort of thing has happened, and it hasn't quite turned out that way. And the reason why is in something profound that Ron said, which is that firms have many options on their menu. Uh-huh. So what I have in mind is um, there was, uh, all through the 40s and 50s, uh, a guest worker program with Mexico called the Bracero program. Um, and temporary migrants came in from Mexico every year, mostly to take agricultural jobs. Mm-hmm. And this program was ended by President Johnson in 1965 with exactly this idea in mind. These are low paid mm-hmm. jobs, it's around a dollar a day. And um, if only we didn't have guest workers from Mexico, these would become higher paid jobs and uh-huh. US born workers would move to the fields. Um, these, this is primarily jobs harvesting by hand. Uh-huh. And it turned yeah. out that that's not what happened. So um, f- farmers were willing to go up a little bit. They went up to $1.25. And mm-hmm. that wasn't enough to attract U.S. foreign workers. And so for the first harvest, a lot of crops actually just rotted in the fields. Wow. And so in the second harvest, farmers changed what they planted. And they ended up planting crops that could be easily harvested by machine. And then also adopting more machinery. So for farms that had not been using machinery and had been using Mexican workers, said, okay, let's buy the machines that are out there. So like tomato harvesters became much more popular. Uh And there's an interesting tidbit in the book that sort of, you know, from my own life and maybe from your lifetime as well, that I remember growing up I was born in the late 70s, so in the 70s, early 80s, which was a period um, that was still relatively low immigration, um, the vegetables that were available in U.S. grocery stores were very limited. We had iceberg lettuce, we had a lot of frozen vegetables, um, and um, I remember thinking as a teenager, well, why are my parents always serving us this? And then (laughs) in the late 90s, early 2000s, suddenly there was this explosion of, you know, microgreens and arugula, and I realized- Avocados. yeah, yeah avocados from <laughs> California. And I realized, oh, it's not because of my parents' palate. It's because we now have immigrants coming in who are picking by hand again. And because people are picking by hand, farmers have shifted back to oh, crops wow. that are hand harvested. And so these are the options on the firm's menu. Huh. It's, it's not just U.S. workers versus immigrants. It's also machinery. It's also outsourcing so that you're actually farming in Mexico and re-importing the fruit. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, offshoring and outsourcing an, uh, an automation of different kinds. Um, and so it turns out that closing the border really isn't going to be the panacea to help um, U.S. born workers in that way. Um, okay, interesting. Yeah, thank you. Um, and we have a question from uh, Celine Malro who asks, in her essay, We Refugees, Hannah Arendt deals with the problems of identity and imposed identity and shows us what it means to be called a refugee. She also uh, discusses how complex the phenomenon of migration is. And she asks, do you think 
assimilation depends on the reason why people moved. I think uh, Ron addressed this in, in one of your responses a bit. Um, I guess how much does this, uh, does that assimilation sort of depend on the reason you moved? And if you're if if you're if you're coming for asylum or you're coming as a refugee and just like you're really not expecting to come home or yeah, how does how does how does that um, yeah how do, how does that affect assimilation? We struggled ourselves with the notion of assimilation, integration. You know, like what exactly the right word to 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 call it? Because there is something that sounds like, oh, you know, there is a broad society, the dominant society, and then immigrants come and then they assimilate into the broader society. In fact, where right. in fact a society that embraces diversity shouldn't require their immigrants to assimilate into any broader society. And even if you do think of a broader society, what do we mean? There are various types of society of uh, of culture. In the, in the United States. And so, yeah, what so, actually uh, melts in the melting pot. <laughs> exactly, is it a, exactly. And, and, then, uh, and then should we aim for a melting pot versus uh, just allowing all the vegetables to shine in, yeah. a, in, in, a, in a nice salad bowl? And so, and so, the, and so we talk about this uh, quite, quite a bit in, in the book, the research that we, and, and nothing in what we say kind of like uh, in, indicated immigrants should assimilate into the broader society. It's more like a, uh, as social scientists looking at the world, thinking, you know, when immigrants look out the world and they think about the cost and benefits of retaining their original identity for the benefits of assimilation, do they choose to reduce some of their ethnic markers for the benefits of assimilation, or do they kind of like a, a prefer to keep their own identity? And, and again, we find evidence for both. They both... Uh, uh, keep the uh, markers of identity, but as well as well as uh, trying to to integrate. And again, some of these things might be defensive, as Leah indicated. Like you know, yeah. the, if you feel that uh, uh, you know your son will be discriminated against in the school or uh, at war or, or at in, uh, or do not find a job, mm -hmm. then you might end up actually uh, uh, assimilate. Uh, uh, faster, not because you want to, but because you feel that you really need to. And, and, and that could be one of the reasons why we find that among the groups who assimilate, you know, like assimilate fastest are the ones uh, who get the most complaints from the natives, like Italians in the pressure. past or Mexicans today. And, yeah. well, and mm -hmm. we do find that um, refugees assimilate faster along certain metrics that we're able to bring from the data. Um, and I think that that part of the book really highlights some of the real novelty of the data sources that we're able to use. I mean, before the work that we've done, um, certainly historians knew that there were refugees from Europe fleeing persecution, fleeing famine and war, uh, but they weren't able to pick out in the data who was a refugee and who was coming for economic opportunity. Mm -hmm. And in fact, within almost every European group, there are some immigrants of each type. It's not just that the refugees in our data are all Jews fleeing from the Holocaust or fleeing from the czar. Um, right. There are some Jews who their stories really do indicate persecution and others that indicate that they're coming to meet family um, to find economic opportunity. The same mm -hmm. is true for Germans and for the Irish and so on. So we're able to look uh, at people who, from their own story, do seem to be fleeing per persecution. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also really just amazing that we were able to um, recover as a data set over a thousand hours of spoken English by immigrants from a hundred years ago. I mean, it's it's like you're Man. you're like listening to the dead and. The, you know, the data is just sitting in plain sight, in a sense, it's not like we had to find it hidden in a dusty archive in the library, you can actually go online to the Ellis Island Foundation and you can listen to some of these uh, tapes yourself. Um, but no one had thought, well, if there's a thousand stories, then, then that's data, that's not just a, an, a story. And so yeah. since we have this kind of quantitative bent, we're always looking around the world to think what can we turn into a data set. And if I can, if I can add one one yeah. thing, just a, uh, it's an interesting question about this identity. One of the reasons what that we liked the data from Ellis Island is that we let the immigrants tell us in their own words what why they came. We don't just say, oh, what the government decided that they come for uh, is it legitimate reason or not. We let them speak, and if they say that uh, they escaped persecution or war or they felt unsafe in their own country, then we call them refugee immigrants, even if the law at the time did, would not 
qualify them or, or uh, you know for refugee status and if they say that they come for family and so we we almost like let the immigrants speak in their own words that way to to listen to what they what they say the stated reason for for coming here so actually can i can i ask about that actually so i when when you first mentioned these records i was assuming that these were written records or written documents are they are they recordings and they're, they're both they yeah from the okay they are recordings and some of them were already transcribed so that you could read the stories. Okay. Others we had to transcribe ourselves um, so that we have both the written version and we actually all have for all of them uh, the audio files. That's and more so generally, if, the, if that's what you meant, more, more generally, you know, we use the, the census records are more like, you know, the boring government documents that tell you what's the occupation and income and, yeah. and, uh, and all that stuff. But we, in addition to that, we also used oral histories as another source of data and congressional speeches. And we try to kind of, as oh, okay. Leah said, you know, turn into data every, everything that looked like a lot of stories uh, uh, in the, whether it's spoken or written or, or in government records and so on. Okay, that's what, cause I'm thinking, I mean, if you're talking about a hundred, I mean, is this, are they, if it's a hundred years ago, are they, are they on like wax cylinders? I mean, oh what? no, oh. so what happened was they were asked about their life when they were getting old. So they were record, okay. they were recorded in the 1970s, but okay. these were people okay. who had come to the U.S. in 1910 or 20, and so they may have come as a teenager or 20 something, and by the time that they're interviewed, they're very old. Retrospective okay. interviews. Yeah. Okay. Oh wow, that's great. I okay. That thank you. I was that's fascinating. Um, uh, Celine has uh, another question asking: uh, Do you see your book? as a sort of expose that could bring about social change and comparing it to uh, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle and Jacob Rees' uh, How the Other Half Lives. So I do see ourselves as bringing about social change, or at least that's our, um, one of our hopes. But my uh, parallel was um, more Oscar Handlin, who was a professor of history at Harvard mm -hmm. um, in the 1940s and 50s, and his book, The Uprooted. Um, and his book was about immigrants from Europe um, during the Ellis Island period. But he was the first person to really think of the immigrants as people, as individuals with, with stories, not just as a flood, not just as a number of, oh, there were a million people coming, but um, to, to go back to understand their motivations and their psychology. Um, and he worked very closely with President Truman to rewrite what we understand uh, immigration uh, history to be in the US. And it eventually led to a pamphlet that was ghostwritten, and, but the name on the pamphlet is um, Senator John F. Kennedy when he was oh, Senator okay. from Massachusetts. Yeah. And as he was thinking about running for office, um, he, he was approached to say, would you put your name on this? And the pamphlet was called A Nation of Immigrants. And mm -hmm. a lot of what's underlying that pamphlet was coming from Oscar Hanlon's work. Mm, um, okay. He also testified in Congress and that sort of thing. Um, so while we did not write this book as with some sort of, a, you know, a specific political agenda in mind, like there are no specific policy proposals at the end, you know, we do feel like there's gridlock and we, we would like to um, help move towards action and change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, this is probably out of the purview of the book, but it just, I mean, in terms of the name of the brochure, I, I, when, when was the sort of nation of immigrants phrase, when was that, was that what popularized it? Was that kind of a common phrase already? Do you know that? That is what popularized the phrase as far as oh. I know. Um, oh. And it was, I believe in the, in 1961, it was uh, in that period um, that um, the the phrase was put onto the pamphlet that really summarizes it all. Um, mm -hmm. But that's the essence of the program that had been going on for around 10 years to to rewrite the history to say it's not like there are Americans and then immigrants as two yeah. separate entities, but we are actually a nation of immigrants. Mm -hmm. And now we hear that phrase all the time and we see, you know, it, the Statue of Liberty as being synonymous with immigration, yeah. but also with America. And the thing mm -hmm. is, is that those, those um, images and, 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 and those associations are not necessarily just organic. Um, they don't come about, um, uh, without some effort on the part of politicians. Right? And, and, it's, and it's not such an un, unbelievable story in the sense that, you know, 
of immigrants, of people in the US today can trace their ancestors either to the Ellis Island generation or to today's age of mass migration. So this is a lot of Americans are, are, have their, they are immigrants themselves or the descendant of immigrants. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I think, uh, I think that's about time. <laughs> I think we'll, I think we'll leave it there. Well, we do, we have this one more question. I don't know if you want to speak to this or um, uh, someone asking, you, are there illustrative comparisons or correlations to be made between the immigrant groups common to the Alice Island generation and the immigrant groups who are relocating to the U.S. today? I don't, I, I notice saying you're in the, in the book jacket, for instance, there, there are comparisons sort of the the way that Irish were pressured to to assimilate versus how Mexicans are pressured to assimilate today. Are there kind of that, I mean, I'm sure it's very overly simplifying things, but are there yeah. kind of one-to-one -one yeah. sort of ratio, you know, comparisons like that to be made? Well, one thing to, that I was surprised by when I went, when we went through the research is, first of all, how different the two time periods are, but yet how similar the outcomes are. Okay, so when we talk about 100 years ago and today, immigrants from 100 years ago were almost entirely from Europe. Mm -hmm. And that is partially a result of policy. There was a Chinese Exclusion Act that then extended to the rest of Asia, whereas mm -hmm. immigrants from today are from around the world. Because immigrants from the past were from Europe, they were from countries that were relatively well off in the scheme of things. Mm -hmm. Some of them were on par with the US, some of them were not as well off, but they were not the poorest countries in the world. Whereas today we have immigrants from some very poor countries. So given all of those differences in who's coming, I was just so floored by how common the immigration experience is actually between the past and the present. I know that doesn't speak to exactly a one-to-one -one correspondence, but really sure. the patterns are so similar in mm -hmm. terms of the upward mobility of children um, and the pace of change for the first generation. But that's what really stuck with me. In, in fact, we view, we view this as one of the main takeaways of the book that, uh, you know, the, the American dream uh, for immigrants is, is just as real today as it was in the past. And that, uh, uh, and that uh, if you like the Ellis Island generation uh, and how they, they ended up doing, then you should uh, appreciate uh, today's uh, immigrants as well, because they seem to be on, on a similar path. And that uh, if immigration policy was a little bit more taking the long view and uh, thinking about immigration in terms of generations, uh, rather than just in terms of like uh, when immigrants just arrive, then then uh, we can learn a lot from the uh, from the age of mass migration and Ellis Island generation. And the story seems quite positive and uplifting for, for immigrants. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for that. Closing, closing question, closing remark. Um, thank you. This, this is a fascinating conversation, and it's really, um, just really useful and clarifying to to hear this in a in a, such a short span of time too. So, uh, but in any case, thank you so much for to both of you for joining us tonight, and uh, thanks to those of you listening in. Uh, again, the book is uh, Streets of Gold, and I have posted the link to purchase copies of the book from harvard.com in the chat. Uh, thank you so much, uh, and uh, have, a, have a good evening, and all of you stay healthy and well, and happy reading. And, and again, thank you all for having, thank you for having thank us. You. Yeah. Thank Thanks you, Nell. Thank you for moderating, and everyone for being here, and all your questions. Thanks.